Well, thanks everyone. Uh, we have a real treat here uh, in our next talk. Uh, we have Naval Ravikanth, who for many in this room doesn't require much of an introduction, um, and I won't embarrass you too much, Naval, but Naval is known uh, in this industry at least as a very early thought leader um, and someone that has been on point and has called many of the trends in blockchain. And I think it's a fair statement to say that uh, many projects uh, have Naval as a you know, advisor or founding force. I know back from your time at Venture Hacks, you've made it a point to help out uh, the younger generation in building out uh, technology. So I just wanted to give a warm welcome uh, to Naval and thank him for joining us. Thank you. All right, and with that, let's jump right in. And I just wanted to start off just a little bit broad to set the stage. Uh, many people uh, might be somewhat new to crypto, in it for 12 months, two years. Uh, but in your judgment, what is the sort of state of the union, so to speak, or where are we in crypto uh, and in blockchain in your judgment? And sort of how does that compare to where we were called a year ago? Uh, down. <laughs> 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 Sorry, everyone. Um, I don't know. I, I guess nobody checks coin market cap as much as we all used to, right? Um, we're, we've definitely been through a hype cycle, and, and it's the nature of crypto back to the beginning of Bitcoin that it's been through booms and busts and booms and busts, but it tends to kind of go up into the right on a, on a long enough time frame if you squint. Um, this last run-up was very unique in that this was really the, the coming of age of a whole bunch of coins other than, uh, other than Bitcoin. Um, many of them based on the Ethereum ERC-20 platform. Um, so we kind of went through that hype cycle. Uh, I think financially speaking, uh, this last time, it felt like an almost, like we almost broke into the mainstream. We almost broke into the mainstream discourse. We almost had retail investors like really participating. We almost broke into payments. We almost got Wall Street completely involved, but we didn't quite get there. Uh, but I, I think what did happen was that we laid the financial foundation and infrastructure for a real innovation phase. Uh, at the, and now it is very acceptable for mainstream Silicon Valley companies and top tier talent to be working in crypto. And those people aren't going away. They're not gonna stop working in crypto just because the prices are down. Um, I think the, the technology advancements that are being made on layer one consensus, decentralization, et cetera, are really interesting. Um, now we did have more than our fair share of fraud and gambling and casino-like activity. That's the nature of uh, financial instruments and markets, unfortunately. But you know, all, all things considered, we actually made it through pretty well. Uh, if you look at the uh, first uh, dot-com bubble, the big one, um, that was in the several trillion dollar range. Uh, and the amount of uh, actual money that was lost was very large, like the amount that was misdirected into, say, building out fiber optic cables where none was needed and so on. But I even that infrastructure innovation wave laid <laughs> the groundwork for the real breakthroughs that started happening in the mid-2000s. So uh, hopefully that's what happened here also. Right. So you mentioned sort of this feeling of we were just on the, the cusp or the precipice and um, many of the headlines that we see as of late, you know, we had Yale investing uh, in a colleague's fund, Matt Huang, and uh, Fred Ernst on Coinbase. Uh, Yale is also invested in um, Andreessen's fund. We have the Bitmain IPO looming in the horizon. So what, where, where are we in this institutionalization and what do you see the next 12 to 18 months uh, bringing in that front? And do you sort of view this as, as sort of from the, the lens of the LPs or people that are allocating capital, what kind of signal do these sort of smoke screens or, or um, uh, smoke signals provide to them when they're going through their process, when you're, when you're talking with the allocators? Yeah, Matt Huang and Fred Ersam and Charlie Noy started this fun uh, paradigm, which, uh, you know, you could, you could say it's sort of Sequoia crypto light because Matt came out of Sequoia. So a lot of Sequoia's LPs went in there, including Yale. And then uh, Chris Dixon and crew started A16Z crypto, which came out of Andreessen Horowitz. So their LPs went in there. So it's not like those LPs necessarily would have gone into non-Andreessen, non-Sequoia funds, but the fact that they did that now legitimizes it, means that other LPs aren't as scared to step forward, other VCs aren't as scared to step forward. Uh, and at this point, you can see that basically uh, three or four out of the top funds in the world, uh, at least Andreessen, USV, and Sequoia, 
have basically given the green light on crypto. Um, and it's literally, to, to their credit, that is what keeps those funds alive and separated from the pack, that they're always willing to kind of go to the edge and take these risks when other VCs will sort of dither and sort of wait for it to be more obvious. So I do think there is a legitimization story there, but it's not instantaneous. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the other endowments, they're, they're, they're going to kick the tires for another 12 months. And they've already been kicking the tires for the last 12 months. Uh, and before, they didn't want to get in because the price was too high. Now, they don't want to get in because there's been a crash, right? Mm -hmm. So they can always talk themselves out of it. But I think they'll slowly start inching in. Uh, I did hear an unverified rumor that there is a big endowment now that is buying like 10 million bucks a month of Bitcoin. Uh, it's, just, it's in rumor category, but you can't completely dismiss it. I think they've been doing their homework long enough that they can start doing things like that. Uh, the institutions have really been waiting for custody to arrive, mm -hmm. uh, high-quality custodians. And uh, uh, they have to be both SEC-qualified custodians, plus they have to be crypto-technically uh, uh, qualified. And uh, now you have Coinbase, you have BitGo, you have Anchor, you have Ledger, you have others who are very serious custody players. Um, and you also have the larger institutions, the larger classic financial institutions are looking at getting into crypto custody. So I think for the institutions to come in, you need to have custody and custody is being taken care of. Um, so th that's, that's gonna be foundational infrastructure. That said, I, I wouldn't get too caught up in the institutions have to come in. Right. Yes, that's where the money is, but that's not where the dream is. Uh, the power of crypto is in decentralization and institutions by definition are centralized. We didn't create a new decentralized currency so that we could have a new bank. We created it so that you could be your own bank or so that you didn't need a bank. Uh, and to the extent that you have more speculators arriving, which is really what these institutional investors are, um, it's okay, it drives up the value and it gets your coin market back up and everybody feels good and it sort of powers the ecosystem, but uh, it is not the real revolution. The real revolution is armies of programmers uh, deploying code for consensus mechanisms that can live outside of any single institution or dictator or king or country or mob or sovereign or company. Um, so I think that the, uh, the, the core underlying technology, there's a ton of innovation going on. You look at the, you know, the ETH guys have really woken up and now it's all, the, you know, constantly Vitalik and Vlad are on Twitter going back and forth about Shasper versus FFG. Like there's, a, there's a, clearly a race on. Mm -hmm. um, you can see all the new uh, protocol mechanisms, the new consensus mechanisms coming up, the Thunders, the Oasis, the Codas of the world, right? You can see like uh, new kinds of proof of works, proof of space times are big now. Uh, a lot of people are innovating in that. Um, you can see, uh, you know, a lot of the privacy coins like Zcash shipping the sapling upgrade. Uh, Monero has shipped some big upgrades recently. You've got Grin with Mimblewimble coming up. So there's, there's just a lot of technical activity. Uh, and it's still very much at the infrastructure layer. It's not at the end user layer. Um, but I feel like now that the technology layer is really getting laid out. Um, and that's the exciting piece. Well, if the institutions come in or not, they'll, they'll eventually come in if the technology works. Um, so it's just a, qu a, a question of when, not if. Uh, but all they are is they're just a signal of the heat in the market. They're not a signal of the fundamentals of the market. Right, right. I'll take it. It's a protocol developer. We can clap to that. Um, so you mentioned uh, this, you know, talking about developers, developer mindshare, developers working on big problems that are fundamental to enabling scalability infrastructure, all those fundamental challenges in the space. What are some of the biggest problems or biggest kind of broken markets or broken incentives that you see out there that you wish more people in general, whether they, tech, they be technical or not, entrepreneurs in the space, should be working on? Yeah, well, there's a stuff that people are already working on, which is uh, I don't think any of the coins are that decentralized yet. Yeah. Uh, Bitcoin is still probably the most decentralized large asset financial instrument that's ever existed, but it's still not sufficiently decentralized because proof of work tends to have a consolidation around the mining. It's just much more efficient to mine within one data center than it's just spread, spread out across many data centers. Um, we also don't have enough developer um, uh, decentralization yet. Within multiple coins we do. In fact, the existence of all the multiple coins is the existence of different dev teams. But if you look at like each coin, there's usually only one serious dev team, one serious client within, within each of the major coins. Um, that's the table stakes. Beyond that, 
uh, I think, uh, two big areas that have not been properly addressed. Uh, one is distribution of the coins themselves. Like how many actual Bitcoin users out there in the world today? I, I, the estimate I've heard is around 25 million, and you know, maybe right or wrong, but it's within the tens of millions of range. It's not hundreds of millions, it's not billions. So not enough people are using these. How many machines, how many pieces of code are using Bitcoin? Uh, they're actually the more likely adopters than humans sending payments to each other, and not enough of those yet. There aren't enough uh, pieces of code that existentially need Bitcoin or Ethereum to function. Um, how many dApps are out there that are uh, up and functioning? Uh, not, not good. Um, how many uh, uh, high-quality end-user secure wallets on Android and iPhone do we have, right? That infrastructure doesn't exist yet. So there's a lot of infrastructure that still needs to be built out. Uh, I think the coin distribution problem is a big one. Uh, you know, Bitcoin, uh, <clears throat> when it first launched, uh, there was a brief moment in time where you could have mined it without being Bitmain or without having a special mining pool or, or a data center kind of set up. So in that sense, it got a quote-unquote fairer distribution. Uh, but a real fair distribution would be to give one to every human on Earth, mm -hmm. or, or maybe two, like one for now, one for later. And how do we? I know in our that? conversations you've talked about fair coin or a concept of a worldwide public distribution. Maybe you could share that with. Uh, the yeah, group. fair coin is just this idea that someone. Uh, there are many teams out there trying to do this. Someone out there is going to figure out how to get coins into a lot more people's hands. So the great thing about a proof of work distribution is it's permissionless. Uh, even if I'm in Venezuela and there's no functioning exchange, I'm not legally allowed to buy it, I can still mine it at home as long as I can kind of generate the electricity um, and I have a server. Um, the problem is that today, proof-of-work mining has become much more consolidated. My home computer is not going to make much of a difference. Um, and proof-of-stake, like Ethereum, the way they would distribute widely, uh, they, well, Ethereum was still proof-of-work, but the way proof-of-stake coins distribute widely is they try and do a ICO. But now with the regulatory crackdown, people are scared of ICOs. ICOs only go to a small number of rich accredited speculators, so it's not really distributing the coin. So the newest thing to come along is airdrops. So you can see like Handshake did a developer-focused airdrop. Uh, Definity did a community-focused airdrop using CoinList, which I'm involved with. Um, so there, there are other ways to kind of get coins into broad hands. But somebody has to figure out how to get coins into enough people's hands that enough people in the world will say, oh yeah, I'm willing to trust this as the new system of wealth storage and transfer and payments. Because it's very hard for me to imagine that uh, you know, 6.9 billion people are going to say, actually, we don't have any of this money, but we're going to go ahead and anoint these geeks who got here first, right. the 100 million of them that have all these coins, and this is the new money, this is the new store of value, you're the new oligarchs, you're the new overlords. History doesn't work that way. You right. generally don't get to take the money without having the guns. And uh, this is not the armed crowd, right? This is the smart crowd. Right. We're not armed to the teeth. Uh, it's not possible to have a bloodless revolution where you transfer you know, tens or a hundred trillion dollars in wealth uh, peacefully. So the only way to do that is to bring everybody along. So I think there has to be some concept of how do we get these coins into other people's hands. And it's a very hard problem in, in a fair way. And the only answer we've had to date was proof of work. And then a little bit was this whole ICO phenomenon. Uh, and we don't have a great answer otherwise. Mm, mm. So, you know, I know that you've been involved in lots of internet technologies and you've had a front row seat you know, back from opinions to uh, present day working with AngelList. What is it that, that sort of je ne sais quoi in your, in your view that is the kind of blocker for wide scale viral adoption? Um, are there analogies to the, to the internet? And do you kind of see this as a bit of a, a, a grind or a slogging kind of process yeah. or is it something that maybe it's sort of a step function that if someone kind of cracks the code, so to speak. But what are some of the elements or signposts that you think are kind of holding back that kind of viral adoption? Yeah, I think the obvious ones are just that there isn't really good wallet software. Mm. Uh, there isn't a killer dApp. Those are kind of the obvious ones. Uh, we also just haven't, we haven't had the combination of a uh, major nation state's currency collapsing while that population has access to a high quality cryptocurrency that they can use on their normal phones. Like that intersection hasn't happened. Um, that would be one powerful driver. But I, I would just be honest and say, I don't know. 
I don't think anybody knows. This is such a new phenomenon, it's such a new system that it's very hard to draw analogies. We redefine what money is, uh, you know, not even every human lifetime. It's in between several human lifetimes. So there's nobody alive today uh, you know, who, who's really watched a transition of this order. Or maybe there are a few people alive, but I'm not even sure the analogies apply. It, when something happens like twice in a generation, like, you know, twice in 20 years, then you have some smart, wise traders or investors or entrepreneurs who are like, oh, I've seen this before, this is how this plays out. There's no real analogy here. Uh, you're, you're basically intersecting uh, money uh, with governance, with technology. And there's the Silicon Valley types who argue programmability and technology is what matters. There's the, uh, there's the Austrian uh, economist types or the anti-bank types, uh, sovereign individual types who argue it's a sound money that matters. And then there's a set who are talking about uh, potential for governance and new kinds of market mechanisms that we're creating here. So I don't think anybody knows. I think we literally just have to do our best and watch it play out. My guess is it is a long slog. I think the, the, the chance for crypto to win in sort of that surprise attack where Bitcoin takes over the world, that, that time period came and went. It's not gonna sneak up on anybody now, right? Um, so I think at this point, it just means that there's a lot of hard work and a lot of patience. Uh, to some extent, every time crypto survives a major bug, it kind of deserves to go up in value. It's a Lindy effect, as Nassim Taleb would say, right? It survived just a little bit more. So there was this recent uh, Bitcoin inflation bug, which fortunately didn't get exploited, but that's the kind of catastrophic bug that would prevent somebody from treating it as purely digital gold. But the fact that we survived that, made it through, now makes that makes Bitcoin a slightly better store of value because it's been through that uh, when maybe another coin hasn't. And I think as it just goes through and survives more and more and more and more of these things, um, you know, it, it, as, it, as it demonstrates its anti-fragility, um, then it deserves to go up in value. But it's a long and slow process. This is, I don't think it's an overnight process. Right, right. So, you know, we're, we're sitting here in San Francisco at a, at a blockchain conference, and so in some ways we're presenting the vision or preaching to the choir a little bit. Uh, in terms of wide adoption of a mind share, there's been a number of sort of high profile skeptics, whether it's the, you know, traditional old guard investment types, the sort of Jamie Dimons and Warren Buffetts of the world, uh, and just other, other categories of people that just say, hey, maybe the use cases are limited. Just kind of playing the kind of philosopher's hat or devil, devil's advocate hat, what do you actually think is the, the strongest argument of the sort of genuine skeptics? Um, and um, maybe we can kind of start with that and then sort of... Sort yeah, of they, they that. have a couple of strong arguments. Uh, one is that in, in many cases where people try to apply blockchains, they'll say, well, blockchain's not needed. It's just an expensive database. Um, that's a good, sophisticated argument, and I would generally agree with that. I, I only think a blockchain is really needed when you need censorship resistance, state-level censorship resistance, because the government, local government is printing money or controlling the flow of, flow of funds. Second is I would call permissionless programmability, um, which is, uh, you know, the, it, you're a developer on the Twitter API and Twitter shuts you down, you have no place to go, whereas if Twitter was running on a blockchain, then you would have a much more open mechanism, people could invest into it and build an ecosystem around it. Uh, and the third one, which is a very related point, is sort of uh, uh, using it as a shelling point to coordinate an entire industry, because it's it's easy to build a company in a proprietary database. You can't really build an industry in a proprietary database, or you can, but it's fragile. The rest of the industry doesn't like it and eventually tries to take it down. So to the extent that like a Filecoin or someone can create a shelling point for uh, its game theory mechanism, just everyone can get together around one thing, um, if they can create this, this mechanism where everybody who's competing with AWS can buy, sell, provide services around the Filecoin ecosystem, then that has some value. But outside of these fairly narrow use cases, you're better off not using a blockchain um, because blockchains are incredibly inefficient, as everybody here knows. You're keeping a copy of everything with, with everybody for the most part. Um, so, it, so I think one strong counter argument they have is that we, in the frenzy, it, it, we try to apply it into areas where it's not applicable. Um, another counterpoint that they give is that the government will never allow it. You know, a lot of the more interesting applications of blockchains do run counter to the control that the modern welfare nation state exercises, um, including the right to censor transactions and the right to print more money and, and so forth, uh, and the right to dilute you and the right to take your money back out of your bank account. Um, and, uh, you know, there's even a nightmare scenario where crypto ends up being the government's most powerful tool. Imagine if, the, you know, the Chinese renminbi or the, uh, the 
US dollar were run entirely on crypto, they could just hit a button and print money. They could hit a button and add money to wallets. They could hit a button and delete your wallet. They could hit a button and track every transaction you've ever done. It's, it's a totalitarian's wet dream. Um, so, you know, it could completely backfire on us in that sense. So I think they have a legit point of view that it's, it, it actually it runs counter in some ways to the way that the current governments are constructed, just in, just in the way that, um, you know, any human rights, ranging from markets to corporations to individual rights, it takes away some power from the government. It's always a negotiation between the individual and the government. But we live in a day and age when the governments are actually very powerful. They're very strong. This is the nuclear age or the, end, or the transition from, you know, out of the information age. So uh, the, will governments allow it is a big deal. I remember when, when uh, crypto was first sort of starting to take off in Silicon Valley in 2013 kind of time frame. A lot of the people who resisted were the people who were early at PayPal because they had seen what happens when you try to send money without being a money transmitter and without the government's permission. Uh, and they'd gotten shut down really fast. Um, so it took them a, a little longer to come around on it than people who didn't have that PayPal experience. Um, so, it, and when you look at people like Warren Buffett and Jamie Dimon, they're used to operating completely regulated atmospheres, mm -hmm. right? They're always watching out for the SEC and FINRA and the CFTC and NYDFS and all that stuff. Um, crypto's global, crypto's distributed, crypto's anarchic, crypto's cyberpunk. It comes from those roots, and, and those roots are embedded at the core algorithm layer. They're not going away. You can pretend that crypto you know, plays well with the state, but it doesn't. Not the way it's written in the code, not, not the way it's designed. Um, so I think they have legitimate points of view that uh, the government will probably not condone of most of it, and it's not applicable in most fields. But I think the argument is that, A, it doesn't matter. Some things are larger than governments. Markets are larger mm -hmm. than governments. Uh, and, uh, and this is a global phenomenon. And second, yes, it may not apply in every field, but in the fields where it does apply, it's incredibly valuable and incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you can redefine what money is, you, you, re you redefine the economy, you redefine society. So it doesn't have to have a lot of applications. Sure, sure. And so kind of wrapping it up as a, as a final summary, um, what do you view, given all of these backdrops, as sort of, you've been on the record in talking about your investment thesis in blockchain, how does that synthesize for you in terms of your updated model of looking at projects and deploying capital? How does that um, kind of impact yeah. the crossroads of where we are now over the next year, two years, and over your investment horizon? Yeah, I, I deploy mostly through uh, my investment in Metastable, which is a crypto hedge fund that I helped start back in the day. Um, and we're still very much focused on deeply technical teams, usually coming out of universities, people like yourself, who are working on layer one kind of scaling, decentralization, consensus mechanism, uh, distribution, uh, kind of problems and so uh, and people who would be working in blockchains even if it wasn't cool and wasn't making them money people who were working in crypto and distributed systems you know years ago so it kind of helps you sort of separate out the, the wheat from the chaff a little bit um, so that's that's an area that we still continue to invest strongly into um, I do see the rise of what I would call uh, I don't think I made this up. I think Spencer Noon made this up or somebody but uh, I like the phrase uh, the shadow financial system um, banking, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think of it as now with companies like DYDX and Dharma and there's a zillion of them, the DEXs and 0x and so on, we're starting to see um, everything Wall Street does that is custom and exotic, and you know this, you were D.E. Shaw, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, everything Wall Street does in terms of its high-frequency trading, the CDOs, the, the, the junk bonds, the leveraged securities, the custom swaps, all the crazy stuff that Wall Street events, invents, this is all done by bankers wearing ties and suits and you know, making a million bucks a year in bonuses, um, done over the phone between like Goldman and somebody else, and it's all very manual. And I think there's going to come a day, two or three or four years from now, where we're going to see that everything they do, crypto does better. And it does it better on ETH or on top of ETH or similar ETH-like platforms, DAP platforms, where you can do trades 24-7, global, trustless, all the derivatives are there, all the shorts are there, you can, uh, stable coins are there, uh, you can trade commodities, you can, you can basically construct a hedge, a bet, insurance, a swap, an index for almost anything you can imagine. And at some point, Wall Street's gonna look at this and be jealous. They're gonna say, wait a minute, I can execute the trade I want actually on crypto, I can't really do it 
in the normal financial system. So the shadow financial system will technologically exceed the regular financial system within a very short period of time because it's open, it's permissionlessly programmable. It's got thousands of brilliant hackers working on it around the globe. Uh, and that global permissionless shadow financial system, it's gonna be very interesting to watch who plays in that, mm. what it does, and how much of the, the, the global market starts moving over. In the early days of crypto, we thought the heat, the, the interesting activity was gonna come from the dark markets, Silk Road, Ross Ulbricht. It may actually come from financial markets on crypto that are bigger than the traditional financial markets or will eventually become bigger. Right, right, and I think that Wall Street is most certainly taking notice. Just as a, a final thought, there's a sort of a lot, of a lot of young people. One of the things that really excites me every day is just the amount of energy and fervor, whether it's at Stanford looking at blockchain course enrollments. Um, one of the things that I really love is I'm like the oldest guy at my company. Um, so what is your kind of parting advice here as we wrap up to maybe young people in the audience, maybe young computer scientists and developers and scientists or even non-technical people that know they want to be a part of blockchain, part of the story, they want to bet their careers on this, but they're just sort of unsure where to start, unsure what projects or what, what sort of a, a framework or a guidepost that you might offer uh, as, as advice to sort of a young person um, wanting to get involved? Well, I mean, if you're technical, contributing to open source projects is always an amazing place to start. Like, there, there's never enough eyes in the code, um, even if it's someone who's just reviewing the code, looking for bugs, debugging, just helping out, even, even writing, you know, technical um, papers, writings, readmes, you know, FAQs, things to kind of help with the technology development. Uh, for all of Bitcoin's incredible thunder and valuation and impact, there's like a handful of developers working on it. It's tiny. Right. Um, so it's very easy to make a difference on the code base. And by that, you can, and after that, you can build a gargantuan reputation. Everybody wants to hire someone who's worked on the Bitcoin or Ethereum or Zcash sure. core code base, right, or Monero or what have you. So I think that's an obvious way. Um, community development is a big deal. There's still, I, I'm, I still have a very hard time. People say, uh, teach me crypto, right? Yeah, yeah. Pointing them to like the master set of resources very hard. Uh, part of it is nobody accumulates the master set. Part of it is that uh, everyone has their own agenda and their own point of view. So you, you know you might end up with an XRP maximalist over here, a Bitcoin Cash sure. maximalist over over there. Keep an open mind. Don't be too tribal. Nobody knows. Um, uh, so I think just constantly educating people. Uh, building communities is very useful and we're always coming up with new things It's always a moving target like what's going on the latest with Zcash and Monero and privacy how do bulletproofs compare to sure. whatever's going on in Saplink? Uh, can you build a, uh, comp a Compressed blockchain in ZK snarks or should you go for ZK starks? Uh, you know are trusted study setups and multi-party computation really viable or they're like a temporary thing, right? So it's all these questions. They're, they're always coming up. So just learning and then uh, synthesizing and communicating and helping people and building a community around it, I think is, uh, is also super helpful. Um, so that's a perfectly fine way to start. At the end of the day, just start whatever interests you because that's what you're gonna stick with. Uh, and whatever interests you and you stick with is whatever you're gonna be good at. Like if you, if you try to do something because you see somebody else doing it, it's not, it's not gonna work that well, right? right? And, and there's so many um, great little places to just insert yourself. Like as an example, I would point to uh, Eric Meltzer's proof of work newsletter, right? Um, all, what Eric did was he very cleverly basically went to a couple of top projects and said, hey, do you want to keep investors up to date? If you just give me your update you know, every week as to what you've done on the tech side, I'll just ship it out to a bunch of investors. And now he's got one of the hottest newsletters in town. All the, mm. all the top crypto projects write in, all the investors review it and watch it. There are people who have built Telegram groups and Slack communities that, are, that have a lot of interest. Um, so I, I think uh, can, can either uh, working on the open source piece uh, or on uh, the uh, synthesis and communication, it, those, are, those are really good areas. Um, if you're a lawyer, help somebody out on the legal side. Uh, if you're in politics, uh, you know, help us out on the lobbying side. Uh, help, help make it so that small crypto transactions don't have to be reported and tracked for tax reasons. Um, you know, help us with the, the tax accounting and tracking. Help us with the, um, you know, the, lega the legality of it, defending it on First Amendment and freedom grounds. Um, I, I think we all have to be ready for the day when crypto gets nailed with a really bad transaction. Mm.
okay? It's kind of inevitable that something terrible is going to happen and whoever instigated it, instead of using gold or diamonds or pallets of USD, uh, you know, they use Bitcoin or ETH or Zcash or Monero or something along the way. And it doesn't even have to be a lot of it. It could even have been a small component. But the press and the politicians will seize on a narrative. And if you look at Republicans or Democrats, wherever you stand, the one thing they tend to unite on is national security issues that take away your freedom. Right. Right. Things like the Patriot Act, uh, you know, the, the, the NSA surveillance, Edward Snowden out of them completely, yet nothing has happened about it. So uh, I just worry that um, we're one sensational incident away from a coordinated crackdown of, on our freedoms uh, of crypto. And, and fundamentally, crypto is just code. It's just math. It's just written down math. Uh, and code is just speech. It's just, and speech is just thought. So at some level, to shut this down, they have to control your thoughts, but doesn't mean they won't try. Um, so I think it's very important to lay the groundwork for crypto from an individual liberties and human freedom perspective so that it, it doesn't automatically become the scapegoat. Um, because the government loves scapegoats. If something bad happens, they don't want to say, oh, it's our fault on our watch. No, no, it was crypto's fault. All right. So we'll leave uh, liberty and freedom as the final uh, rallying cry here. I think there was a lot of uh, really straightforward, practical wisdom um, that Naval shared with us. So uh, thanks again.